The digital age is made possible because these previously separate technological trajectories converge on the digital paradigm, on the digit, on the binary digit, on the bit. The person who conceptualized the idea of the bit is Claude Shannon, a mathematician that worked at Bell Labs. And he was a genius inventor, interested in all kinds of tricky questions. One of the tricky questions he was very interested in throughout his life, for example, was the question of how small a unicycle could be that you could still ride on it. And he built about 30 unicycles himself. He rode around on them in the hallways of MIT, people say that was quite dangerous. He also built a chairlift that led him 600 feet from his house to a lake in front of his house. He built 100 bladed knives. He built a machine that could solve the Rubik cubes. He um, built mechanical juggling machines and one of the first chess computers. Uh, in his master thesis, he tied for the first time Boolean logic to electronics. People say that was the most influential master thesis of all times. And on the way, he also invented the digital age. He died at the age of uh, 84 after a long battle of Alzheimer in the year 2001. So he still saw the fruits of his work. And the biggest technological pioneers, if you mention the word Claude Shannon, they do the I'm not worthy. Uh, he is also one of my personal heroes and I have the honor to introduce him to you. Uh, get to know him a little bit better through this video. The fundamental premise on which Shannon built his theory was that he said information is the counterpart to uncertainty kind of like the opposite, which makes intuitively sense. If you have uncertainty, you don't have information. And if you have information, you don't have uncertainty. And then he said, communication of information is the process of uncertainty reduction. Now it makes intuitively sense. What he then said is that, well, uncertainty, we can quantify with the help of probability theory. We can calculate how uncertain something is. Therefore, we can quantify information with the help of probability theory. And that led to what people nowadays call information theory, which is a mathematical theory that allows us to quantify information and the communication process. Um, the fundamental unit in this theory is the bit. Shannon himself often used to explain the power of the bit with a child's game of 20 questions. So there are two children, one thinks of a city in the United States and the other one has to extract this information through a communication process. Now you could say, is this city San Francisco? No. Well, is it New York? No. Los Angeles? No. Is it Davis? No. Is it Seattle? Uh, and you have to ask a lot of questions until you might hit the nail on the head. Shannon showed that the most efficient way actually is you do what computer scientists nowadays call greedy search. You always divide the probability space by half. So if you have no indication at all where it is, you might say, we divide the United States into East and West. So is it East of the Mississippi or West of the Mississippi? And we say, okay, it's West. Then we say, well, is it North or South of this line? Then again, we divide the, then we say, well, it's North. Then afterwards, we again divide the probability space in half. We say, is it East and West of that kind of block? Is it North or South of that kind of block? And we go down, down and down. And you can show that there's an exponential logic with revealing the number of choices. And after only 20 questions, you're only already to the equivalent of one than more, more than 1 million choices that allows you to zoom down to five square miles. So you're surely going to have the city that the person has in mind with 20 questions only. So dividing the probability space by half is a very efficient way of extracting information, the most efficient way actually of extracting information and therefore communicating information. And that's the idea of the bit. A bit reduces uncertainty by half. That's basically what a bit is. It is that 
that reduces uncertainty by half. Let's look at a more applied, a little bit more technical example. So you want to communicate the word genius. So let's start with communicating the letter G and you have your uncertainty here. You have 32 letters. You don't know which letter uh, you're going to receive from the sender. Uh, let's suppose they're all uniformly distributed. So the most fundamental way you can go about coding that is you play the game of 20 questions. So you ask, is the letter that you want to send me in the first half, in the first 16 letters, or in the second 16 letters of the alphabet? Well, the bit, the binary choice can tell you one, oh, it's in the first half, or zero, it's in the second half. One or zero is just a choice. It could also be up and down, or, or black and white, or, or elephant and 52. It, it doesn't matter. It always has to be a binary choice. That's why the bit comes from. So, okay, so we say, well, it's in the first half. Then we can say, secondly, well, is it here at the part of the first eight letters of these 16 or the second eight letters? So we go down from 32, 16, 8, then we check the next four, two, one, and then we identified the G. So we needed five bits. We reduced uncertainty five times by half. That results in this code. 11001, zero, zero, one. basically what it says, up, up, down, down, up. And we identified with five symbols, uh, the letter G. So what Shannon basically said is that information has to do with identifying a subspace of different choices. And the metric of information is then how good you're able to identify these different choices. The most fundamental choice is binary. That's not the only choice, uh, but it's the most fundamental because either it goes left or right, up or down, black or white, it is or it is not. And that's also how digital technology uh, compute. So they basically send a signal, electronic signal, or they don't. In a fiber octave cable, they send a little piece of light or they don't. So that's a binary choice. Either there is or there is not. So that's what this binary choice is about. And you can use now this most fundamental uh, way of looking at information to construct different choices and to count different choices. And the counting works in an exponential or logarithmic logic. Why is that? So how many binary symbols, for example, coin flips, do you need to describe eight differences? Well, you start with the first coin flip and you're able to describe two differences, head or tail. Then you have a second coin flip that enables you to describe four differences. So it's head, 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 tail, tail, head, tail, tail. So two coin flips, four differences. Now you have a third coin flip. How many differences can you distinguish? It's eight because now you can distinguish between head, 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 tail, head, tail, head, and so forth. So you have eight different events now that you can distinguish uh, with. So actually with each coin flip, there's an exponential extension to it. Again, the exponential is again, very important. So you have two choices with one symbol, you have four choices with two binary symbols, and you have eight choices with three binary symbols. How many would you have with a fourth coin flip? 16 choices. So what you can see here that the number of choices you can describe grows uh, exponentially with the number of symbols that you do following this little tree logic that we have here. So we can also write it this way. So eight choices can be described by three flips of a binary symbol. So at every flip, you distinguish two more. So that's basically two times two times two is two to the power of three is equal to eight choices. And if you take the logarithm of these eight choices, you can now reduce it again to the number of flips you have to do, to the number of symbols, to the number of, in this case, binary 
digits, the number of bits you need to identify a choices. That's why the logarithm is very important in information theory. It goes according to this kind of exponential logic. So let's do that again. We want to transmit our letter i. So if all the letters are uniformly distributed, we have to reduce the possibility space by half again five times and the resulting code would be 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. The question would be, is it in the first half? Yes, no, yes, yes, yes. And this gives us five bits. Now, in reality, this probability space of all the letters is not uniformly distributed. Some letters are much more common than others. That actually means you have less uncertainty because it's more likely that the letter E is communicated than the letter X is communicated. Also, if you just received the letter Q, what do you think would be the next letter you are likely to receive? Yeah, there's not a lot of uncertainty. It probably is going to be a U. A Q is usually followed by a U. So there's less uncertainty. And Shannon said we have to consider that. Actually, since the Morse code, they already considered that some are more likely than others. And the more likely ones, they gave the dots. And the less likely ones, they gave the dashes. So to make it actually quicker. And Shannon said we have to follow the same logic and see what's the probability distribution. And if we then look at the probability distribution, we can take out these kind of things that are actually no surprise. Because if you already know that the next letter is a U, I might not even have to send it to you. I just say, yes, there's no uncertainty in it. So you already have the information. And taking that out then, that's what led to uh, the formal definition of information theory. But the basic idea is still that one bit is that that reduces uncertainty by half. Shannon formalized this idea with his source coding theorem. In this theorem, he asked, what is the purest form of information? That means if we take everything out, that's not surprising. Every redundancy we take out and we compress it and only consider the real surprise, then we get to the what he called the entropy of the source. So entropy, that's the most fundamental metric in information theory. And the unit with which it is me measured are bits. And what still holds is that one bit is that that reduces uncertainty by half. So a bit depends on what you already know, the information you already have. And when this information that you have is reduced by half, then you got one bit of information. In order to get to the entropy of the source, compression is very important. And the basic idea of compression is, as I said, you take out everything that's not surprising. Everything that doesn't reduce uncertainty might be data, but it's not really information in the sense of Shannon. So there's a difference between data symbols and that that reduces uncertainty, which is information in Shannon's sense. And Shannon said, you can take that out. If it doesn't reduce uncertainty, it's not information. So imagine it this way, an old couple, when grandpa talks to grandma, he might say something like this. Try to read this phrase. Now you're still able to read this phrase, even so I took out some data, but I didn't take out any information. I compressed basically the data and getting closer to the entropy of the source. For that, you can then also consider the probability distribution. You know that most probably the missing letter is this. So, uh, and if it's the most probable, it doesn't reduce much uncertainty. And the digital age makes a lot of use of these kind of compression. Uh, they are not called grandma and grandpa. They are called things like GSM, SIP, MP3, uh, MPEG, JPEG, and so forth. So basically what they do is they take a kind of informational source and then they communicate with their twin. Shannon often used to explain that with the logic of twins. And if one, the sending program says, well, you already know that the next letter is going to be a Q, then it doesn't even send it because it knows that the receiver 
since they are twins, they are the same program, decodifies the next letter, would decodify the next letter with a U, so it's not even sent. Now, that means you transmit less data at the end and then you can communicate more information because by not having to send the queue, I can already just already send the next piece over the channel. That means I can really exploit the channel capacity. So you try to reduce the number of symbols of plain data and maximize the flow of information. That's the idea of compression. And this idea finds very practical applications. For example, if you see a video, everything that is communicated, if this video is streamed, is the stuff that's changing. If the background is still a house, then that just stays constant and I don't always have to transmit it again over the channel. I just say, project a house and leave it there. So over my channel, I don't have to transmit it anymore. I can use it to transmit other, more information, things that really reduce my uncertainty. Now the moving grandpa, that has uncertainty with it, so I have to transmit it. Shannon proposed this idea of compression back in the 40s, in 1948, but it was not until almost 50 years later that people really achieved Shannon's source coding theorem, the full potential of it, uh, with something that's nowadays called as turbo codes. One footnote, there's something also called lossy compression. For example, if you record a video with your phone and then you upload it to a social media site or you send it with your phone, it usually gets also compressed. But this is often lossy compression. That means, that's not really compression actually, it just means that part of the information is eliminated. It gets coarse grained. So if you zoom in, you can see, well, it lost some quality. Um, that basically just means you take out some information. So lossy compression is a misnomer. Real compression just means you take out everything that doesn't reduce uncertainty. Everything that's simply just data symbols. And you're left with the pure information with what Shannon called the entropy of the source. So if you ask what drives the global growth of information, of technologically needed information in the world, there are actually three components you have to consider. Two main groups. First of all, you have the number of technological devices. And second, their performance. So if you want to know the growth of information in the world, that's uh, what, what I have estimated a, a lot, then you need these two components. Now, the infrastructure, the number of devices you could think of in storage of information, for example, like the number of buckets that you have. Well, count the number of buckets. That's how much info that tells you something about it. And then there can be big and small buckets, but there are two different things. Now there's hardware, that means it's the bucket big or small, and then it also has to do with the granularity of what you fill into the bucket. So if I want to know the number of stones that this bucket can carry, it depends on how big these stones are. And that's how you can think about compression. So compression just says, well, we take everything away from the stone that doesn't really matter and just leave the core of the stone. And when the stones are smaller, we can pack more into the same bucket or communicate more information over the same channel. And that has increased the world's capacity to process information a lot. So on average, the world's total capacity to store information has grown at about 25% a year. And this 25% is made out of a 5% increase of having more buckets, a 8% increase of having bigger buckets, so that would be Moore's Law, for example, the hardware is increasing. And 11% of this growth comes from the fact that we compress information. So these are compression algorithms. We take the same amount of information, take out all the data, make it smaller, and we can pump more through the same channel. We can store more on the same hard disk. So compression plays a very, very important role in the global information explosion.